Perfect. So hello, welcome. Um, my name is Alison Desmond and I am the Digital Marketing Specialist for Velocity Growth. Um, we are one of the title sponsors here for DC Startup Week. So thank you very much for joining us. So DC Startup Week is a five day conference held in the fall every year, focused on building the startup community. We want to give a quick shout out to all the title sponsors. So next by Schumann Rogers, Silicon Valley Bank, Zendesk, Velocity Growth, uh, Think Nimble, uh, Arison, and sorry, no. perfect. Um, and NFP. So thank you so much to Heather uh, for joining us today. I'm very, very excited for this. Uh, the art of pitching, which obviously is so, so important. So if you have any questions throughout the talk, uh, please put in all caps uh, your question at the start of the chat so we can make sure we don't miss any questions. Uh, and we'll also take questions at the end as well. Uh, we are very excited to hear Heather speak today all about the art of pitching. So thank you so much for joining us, Heather. And uh, yeah, start away. Okay, awesome. Hello, everybody. Let me share my screen real quick. If Allison, if you can let me know when you can see the good boy. Oh. <laughs> Perfect, Heather. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, let me move Zoom windows that always inevitably end up in just the wrong spot. And here we go. Can Is that coming through okay? Perfect, Heather. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Hello, DC Startup Week. My name is Heather Lover. I'm the founder of Perfectly Pitched, and I'd like to welcome you to The Art of Pitching, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love PowerPoint. In startup land, two things are certain. First, every startup needs a pitch deck. And second, every founder needs to present. Yet, as vital as these two things are to every startup's future, why do they remain such a mystery? At Perfectly Pitched, we're determined to help founders like you demystify the pitching process using our unique tips, tricks, and methods that we'll go over today. Tips and tricks, which by the way, have helped our clients raise over $10 million in the past year alone. Best of all, that money was raised by 97% underrepresented founders. So let's dive in and increase your odds of getting funded too. To get started, let's take it back to the very beginning and talk about the goal of pitching. Lots of people will think, oh, it's to make money, to have investors fire up that money gun in your general direction. Actually, while money is wonderful and necessary, and yes, definitely part of the pitching process, it is not in fact your goal. Because getting that money, that investment, is dependent upon your ability to be understood. Over the course of this class, I hope to help you figure out how to present to best explain who you are, what your business does, and what you need to succeed to be fully, easily, and completely understood so that, yes, you'll make it to the stage where someone fires up that money gun in your general direction. Now, let's begin. In order to be understood before you ever open up PowerPoint or Keynote, I want you to start with what I call the stoplight check-in. Three simple steps that form the foundation of your journey moving forward. First, stop and ask yourself, what is my pitch goal? What am I hoping to achieve? When creating a pitch, that should be your first guiding principle. Is what I'm conveying truly helping me meet my goal? If anything isn't serving that goal, throw it out. So much of what you keep versus what you discard depends on proceeding with caution and asking, who is my audience? What are their needs? What are their interests? What's their level of familiarity with the subject matter? Are you going to be talking to lay people or industry experts? That should radically change what you say and how it's presented. Ask this question each time you prepare for a new pitch because each audience will be different and your pitch needs to reflect that which leads into the green light for moving forward. How can I connect with my audience's hearts and minds? How can I connect with them as human beings? How do I meet my needs and theirs? Your pitch is really building the foundation of a relationship. It's not closing the deal. It's not all encompassing due diligence. Rather, it's the impression you hope will lead to an investment and a long time frame of working together. After all, an investor isn't just investing in your ideas, in your company, on its own in a vacuum. They're investing just as much in you as a person, someone they believe can fully implement that idea. Your pitch not only needs to convince them of the idea itself, but they need to understand and believe that you are the person or the team who can make this idea a reality. 
That can't happen without building a relationship between you and your audience. Building a relationship depends on three key factors. It all begins with empathy. You need to find a way to build common ground with your audience. What passions do you share? What pain points can we all relate to? It's important you find a way to build a shared experience. Shared experience is powerful. It's what bonds trauma survivors together or what turns a platoon into a band of brothers. Human beings are unique in that we can develop similar bonds purely through the power of storytelling. It's why two strangers light up when they find out they both love the same book or TV show. It's all shared experience. Think about how you can use storytelling to create that shared experience between you and your audience. It's so much harder to build empathy without authenticity. Try to always be your true self. By being bravely vulnerable, by being human, you will draw out the humanity in others. Being bravely vulnerable is a way to say to your audience without words, I see you and I'm allowing you to see me. That act of bravery builds a powerful bond of trust. Our shared emotions between presenter and audience will help to create lasting connection. Joy, passion, and pain, they are all contagious in a good way. We are hardwired to respond to the emotions of others, all to foster the building of relationships. A well-done pitch can be the foundation upon which a relationship is built, one more likely to blossom into investment, productivity, and shared ideas becoming reality. The best and easiest way to convey all of these things, to create that shared experience of authenticity and trust, is through the power of storytelling. The human mind is hardwired for stories. Whether it's the earliest humans telling each other our shared history around campfires, or a family sharing stories about their day over the dinner table, or my favorite, the all-important bedtime story, shaping young minds while filling their hearts. Stories have a way of conveying deep truths while creating strong and lasting bonds. Indeed, the way our own minds are wired, the way we view who we are as individuals, depends on the stories we tell ourselves. Stories matter because they carry great power. The same is true whether you're reading a story to a child or giving a presentation. As the saying goes, tell me a fact and I'll forget. Tell me a story and I will never forget. As much as possible while preparing your pitch, be mindful of creating a cohesive and compelling story so you'll engage with your audience, connect with their hearts and minds by finding that common ground and by being your authentic self so you can create relationships built on trust all of which will help you to accomplish your goals. Now, to show you how to do that in detail, I'm gonna follow my own advice and tell you a story. So get ready, get comfortable, and let's explore the entrepreneur's journey. How you got to this point in your company informs so much about your pitch, about the story you'll tell and the stresses along the way. So once upon a time, you had an idea. You thought long and hard about whether or not you should pursue it, if it was worth it. You saw a pain point, one you knew affected lots of other people just like you. You imagined a unique and wonderful solution. You could see that beautiful world unaffected by that awful pain point. You knew the market was hungry for a solution, giving you plenty of potential for growth. You figured out why you are the person to solve this problem. Maybe you even have a team who can help. Lastly, you've figured out what resources you'd need to be a success. You thought about all of this and decided, yes, I can make this happen. And with that, you move from idea to adoption. You took that idea, dove in headfirst, and decided to go for it, to make it a reality. With you and your little baby of a company, you moved forward, made the investment, and started on your journey. Now, if you're anything like me, this phase, it can be so exciting, downright intoxicating. It's very, very easy, just like a kid on a sugar rush, to run up that hill so fast that you leap right over an unexpected cliff and crash right into burnout ravine. It's just like hitting a tiny pothole, which is a mild nuisance to a slow-moving car, but that same pothole can spell disaster if you're a race car driving at upwards of 100 miles an hour. The faster you're moving, the easier it is to crash and burn out, but all is not lost. If you're able, if you're determined, if the stars align, you'll pick yourself up, grab some crutches, and reignite that passion. But this time you're going to temper it with a little bit of patience and wisdom, not to mention the slower pace that inevitably comes with a healing leg injury. Incidentally, that is exactly what happened to me with my last venture. I was so excited about being a Halcyon Incubator fellow rushing around the night before a big pitch that I fell and broke my ankle. Oops. So with that little bit of patience and wisdom, you learn from your mistakes, you adapt, and then you begin to scale. 
to implement your plans, to begin recruiting investors, climbing the first hill along the path to the highest peak of the mountain where success awaits. Finally, after that long, hard, difficult, emotionally draining climb, at long last, you reach the first summit and achieve an enlightenment. You are Abraham on the mountaintop, seeing all of history and everything to come. You see everything, both the past and the future. It's beautiful and glorious, both in its entirety and down to its smallest detail. When you think about telling your story in a pitch, you just know you have to tell it all. Anything less than, well, your audience just won't get it. They won't see the beauty that is everything. So along comes your audience. It's time to pitch your company to tell that perfect, all-encompassing macro view of a story. But you only have 10, five, or worse, only three minutes in which to pitch. What are you going to do? They need to hear it all in all of its glory. There's just so much info they need to know. So you grab them by the hand and run as fast as you can. Hurry, they have to get to the mountaintop right now. This is why it feels so impossible to pitch your business in five minutes or less because you can't rush enlightenment. It took you months, maybe even years to get to that mountaintop. How can anyone possibly expect your audience to get there in a few minutes? Besides, remember Burnout Ravine? Just like that race car, the faster you try to go through all of this information, the more likely it is your audience is going to crash. Burnout Ravine quickly becomes the Grand Canyon of info overload. If that happens, your audience is going to check out and not care to reignite a passion they never had to begin with. You just can't rush enlightenment. But the good news is you don't have to. Your audience doesn't have to make it all the way to enlightenment. It's so much simpler than that. When it comes to pitching, all you need to do is get your pitch audience from idea to adoption while making sure they trust and believe that you are perched on that mountaintop seeing everything there is to see. All those other steps in between, they can just go away because all you need to focus on is idea to adoption. So how do you get them there? The same exact way you got there. Remember all those questions we talked about that you asked yourself when you first began your journey. Those are exactly the same things you need to cover in your pitch. If we sandwich those between an intro and an outro, you suddenly have every chapter necessary for a killer pitch. It all starts with an introduction. Who are you? What company do you represent? And a one sentence slogan that provides an introductory summary. It's the ele micro elevator pitch that lays a foundation of context, telling the audience what sandbox we're playing in today. Next, a compelling problem. What's wrong with the world today? How many people are affected by it? Make it compelling, make it emotional, make it human. Next, your unique solution. How do you solve it? What makes you different? How much better will the world be because of it? That leads into market and financials. This is the nitty gritty, what I call the meat and potatoes, that helps convince the audience that you're the enlightened guru on top of the mountain, seeing all and developing plans for the future. Hammer that point home by explaining why now and why you. Why is now the right time to take action? What will they miss out on if they don't leap with you? And why are you the person, the team to make it happen? When someone invests, again, they're not just investing in an idea or a product. They're investing just as much, if not more so, in the people they believe can execute and make it happen. Again, make them believe you're on that mountaintop. The penultimate piece of the puzzle your ask for your future. What are the resources you need in order to reach your specific goals? No matter where you're pitching or why, always, always have an ask. It doesn't have to be money. Oftentimes when we ask for money, it's in order to hire help. What if you just ask for the type of help you need? Sometimes if people aren't able to give their money, they can still offer their time and talents. So don't be shy. Ask for whatever it is you need because you never know who in that audience will be the key to opening the next door of opportunity. After all of that, don't ever forget to conclude with a grateful crescendo. Remind them of that compelling problem and help them feel the emotion of rising to that mountaintop of success where the world will be so much better off because of what you could do together. Thank them for their time and leave them with that positive, memorable impression that you're that enlightened, humble, and grateful guru on the mountaintop, eager to welcome them into a better, brighter future. If you can convey each of these things, you will get your audience from idea to adoption. 
once you get your audience to adoption, that's when they'll be so excited that they just have to come talk to you. You'll start having conversations, follow up meetings, due diligence, all that good stuff. It's during that process when you, in essence, give them a hang glider so they can have a nice gentle ascent to the mountaintop where they'll join you on the rest of your journey. Now that you know your pitch only needs to get your audience from idea to adoption, it's time to cover getting from idea to adoption in a standalone pitch deck that's being emailed to someone to read at their leisure versus you giving a presentation, speaking to an audience, whether you're standing on a stage or over Zoom like this. More often than not, entrepreneurs treat these two as one in the same, but they're entirely different mediums. To me, it's like comparing reading a book versus watching a movie. They're very, very different experiences. And yes, that's a little 16-year-old me in a photo from USA Today when it, uh, they were covering my first company. When it comes to a standalone pitch deck, think of it more like a booklet or brochure that's designed to be read alone at the audience's leisure with no other input from you because it contains all the needed information in order to get that reader from idea to adoption. It's an entirely self-contained little capsule about your company sent out into the world to tell your story while you're off doing other stuff. This is often the piece that gets you the meeting with that potential investor where you can then give your presentation. Reading a pitch is a much, much different set of circumstances than when you're giving a presentation, standing up on a stage or speaking over Zoom. Suddenly you have a wealth of tools you don't get in a book. In this format, you get to engage both sight and sound, maximizing the many different ways that human beings learn and retain information. This helps you to create a cinematic experience that's focused on you and your company as the stars of the show. It's presentations that I'd most like to focus on for the remainder of our time, as they're the most often misunderstood and usually the most stressful. They can appear to be a complex puzzle, one you're unsure how to build because you aren't even sure what the pieces are. I hope to break it down for you by explaining what I call balancing attention. Giving a good presentation is much like a juggling act, except instead of juggling brightly colored balls, you're juggling your audience's attention. That attention needs to be carefully and meticulously managed, split between you as the presenter and narrator and your slides. You are primarily an auditory source, while your slides are a visual source. This presents its own challenges to your juggling act because the human brain naturally focuses more of its energy on visual stimuli. The vast majority of our brain's processing power is devoted to interpreting signals from our eyes. 90% of that information being absorbed by our brain is processed visually. That means in order for you, the auditory source, to be the star, you have to be exceptionally careful in how you plan your slide deck in order to ensure that you remain the star of the show. Think of it as making sure every bit of that 90% of visual stimuli is there to serve you, to reinforce you, rather than distracting attention away from you. In short, the entire purpose of your slides is to make you look better, to make whatever you say more impactful, to make everything about your presentation more memorable, because at all times, you should be Beyonce, <laughs> and your slides, your slides are your backup singers. Everyone should be focusing on you, the star of the show, while the rest of their attention is paid to the backup singers, which only serves to reinforce how awesome you are. So you might be asking yourself, how can I be Beyonce? The trick is in following the example of Queen Bee's backup singers, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Now put your hands up. Notice her backup singers faded back letting Beyonce carry on into the verse. After all, she has her backup singers for a reason, to make her shine. Naturally, Beyonce would lose a little of her luster if they sang every single word she does as she does. Beyonce is not and never has been a choir. This is not about many voices becoming one, but rather one voice standing out from the rest. Similarly, you don't need to put every single word you say up on your slides. It limits their impact, makes them run together, and frankly, it gets boring. After all, this is not merely a projected printout of your script. It's not a teleprompter. Instead, reserve your backup singers your slides for the hook, the chorus, the catchiest bits of an earworm you don't want forgotten. You use your slides to highlight certain impactful keywords, or better yet, visualize meaningful concepts and statistics whatever you want to really drill into those heads, that's what goes on your slides. 
think of it as a sporadic echo or a visual scaffolding to highlight and reinforce your most important statements. Finally, there is one deadly sin that backup singers should never ever commit. Thou shalt not start singing that catchy chorus while Beyonce is about to sing the first verse. That'll get any backup singer fired because spoilers, man, no one wants them, whether it's a TV show, the big game or your slides. Don't ever let your slides get ahead of you. Now, let's take a look at the Beyonce principle in action. Generally speaking, for the majority of your presentation, you should have 75% of your audience's attention on you and 25% on your slide deck. Every so often, you can shift up that balance for the sake of powerful imagery to create extra memorable moments, but it should always be deliberate and planned. Attention must be wielded as a tool, harnessed and directed for maximum impact. That said, most of the time, the audience's attention is highlighting you. Just like with your backup singers, the catchiness of your song depends upon maintaining this balance to ensure your audience is both engaged and absorbing information as easily as possible. The balance is maintained by ensuring your slides always visually represent whatever you are currently saying. When the narration matches the visual, when the audience hears and what they see effortlessly matches, ensuring they easily understand, comprehend, and remember everything you're talking about. In short, you aren't making them work for it. Information is flowing freely and easily. This balance goes awry when the narration either no longer matches the visual or worse, your slides start getting ahead of you, showing seemingly disconnected images that have nothing whatsoever to do with what you're talking about at the moment. Or in other words, spoilers. All of this confusion means the audience isn't listening to you at all anymore. They're too busy thinking, did she click the wrong slide? Did I miss something important? Is the puppy going to wear the turtleneck? I mean, I'd pay to see that, but what's with the windows? I am so lost. At this point, you could be saying, you know the true meaning of life, but no one's going to hear it. They are so confused, you might as well not even be on the stage at all. No one in history has mastered the Beyonce principle better than Steve Jobs. Does the turtleneck make sense now? If this were a regular presentation, your audience's little aha moment would also be distracting them from what you're talking about. But anyway, when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, he famously filled the screen with the iPhone and only the iPhone. The ease and simplicity of pairing spoken word with immediately connected visuals is precisely what made Steve Jobs so revolutionary. To illustrate just how radical his approach was, let's contrast him with Bill Gates. It's just so busy. First off, not only does your eye not know where to go first, but it's literally chock full of spoilers. When he starts out with the first item, People Network, he's talking, but the audience isn't listening to him at all anymore. They can't help but read ahead. It's human nature. Half the audience is wondering what the heck other experiences from Microsoft and others is all about, while the other half is distracted by that sweet iMac in the corner. Now, whatever Bill's saying is going in one ear and out the other. It's all too much. When everything is up there, nothing has impact. So let's go back to Steve Jobs. When Steve had a vital piece of information he really wanted you to remember, he put it front and center. No distractions. Literally all of your attention is on Steve and that number, 499. In that moment, he is Beyonce, the star of the show. He is masterfully guiding your attention right where he wants it, telling his story to its fullest potential. Whenever Steve had more information to convey, he always did so in a clear, organized, easy to follow pattern. Your eye knows exactly where to go and what's being talked about. What's more, Steve never showed the entire list at the beginning. He understood spoilers. This is how he started. He introduced you to what he was talking about first, the iPad, a nice foundation of context. We know the sandbox we're playing in. Then, as he said, the next relevant fact, it appeared on the screen. Then the next, then the next. He's walking the audience through step by step. No one reads ahead and no one gets lost. No one takes their attention away from the star of the show. This is why Steve Jobs is remembered as a master communicator because he always expertly juggled his audience's attention, utilizing their visual and auditory learning in order to balance their attention focusing all of their audience's energy on him as he effortlessly conveyed his message, making it impactful and memorable. This may feel like a huge legacy to live up to, a massive bar to reach, but you, you can do it. 
just like juggling in real life. This skill can be learned. It's simple. Be mindful of your audience. Design your slides in order to manage their attention. And never forget, you're already Beyonce. You've worked hard to perfect your business. You deserve a perfect pitch deck that emphasizes the star that you are. Now that we understand the basics of attention, it's time to move on to how to construct a pitch deck. Here, I'll go over software, basic design principles, and general rules of thumb to help get you started. As you grab your hard hat, I want you to ask yourself this one summarizing question. How can I make sure that everything in my pitch is always, always easy to learn? It's a matter of R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Making things easy to learn is a sign of respect for your audience, including their time. Are you conveying your message in a way that takes up as little of their time as possible? Their effort. Do you want your audience to feel like they have to expend precious energy and effort to understand your message? Of course not. You want it to be easy for them, which means you need to put in the effort so they don't have to. Lastly, it's respect for their attention. We all know attention can wander, so do your best to keep them engaged. Keep them enthralled. Use every tool in your toolbox through humor, empathy, and good design, making sure you're keeping things as engaging as a way to show respect to your audience. So much of what we'll talk about when it comes to construction is about how design can help make things easy to learn so that you can show that respect for your audience. So as we go through, please keep this in mind and think of design from the point of view of R-E-S-B-E-C-T to find out what it means for your pitch. Let's start with software. My personal favorite is Keynote, which I find the most helpful at offering guidance for good design with plenty of customization tools. And it's free if you have a Mac. PowerPoint is synonymous with presentations, but personally, I find it kind of clunky. Canva has some free functionality, which is fantastic. It does have some limited features, but it's still a fantastic solution for startups. Google Slides is also free, but it has such limited features, I find it a little frustrating, but it is getting better and it's great for big teams. Adobe InDesign is really cost prohibitive for early startups. I wouldn't recommend it. I know some people who use Adobe Acrobat, but I don't know why you would when both Keynote and PowerPoint export to PDF. Next up, color. Naturally, you'll want to stick with your brand book. If you don't have one, we can help with that. You want to make sure your colors, your overall style and branding are consistent, not only so you look professional, but most importantly, so you stay recognizable to your customers and potential investors. Once you get them from idea to adoption, you want it to be a seamless experience between your presentation to then when they go to your website or view other marketing materials in order to learn more. A great deal of that consistency depends on developing usage patterns, rules of how you will utilize color. For instance, as you'll notice, my headers in this section of the class will all follow the same pattern. The two bars of color on each side, the icon on the left. I'm color coding each segment so the colors will change, but the placement stays the same. You can use pattern and color to help train people subconsciously where to look for certain types of information. It also helps give them a sense of comfort that as they get used to the color patterns, they'll have some idea how long each segment lasts. You'll find patterns with all of my icons as well. They're always a colored circle with a simple white icon in the middle. Patterns matter. Find ways to create patterns and stick to them so that your audience will get used to how they'll find and perceive information. Lastly, contrast. You need to make absolutely certain that there's enough contrast between your uses of color so that it's always easy on the eye and easy to understand. If you lose contrast, things can become hard to read. It's not just about grays on whites though. It's also about color on top of color. That's not only hard to read, it can be kind of painful to look at. So let's get rid of that, so much better. In short, be very careful how you use your colors to make sure they're always readable, clear, and looking their best. When it comes to fonts, there are a few good rules of thumb. Text that's too small can't be read. It probably looks okay here on Zoom, but still not great. But in a conference room or a ballroom, remember, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, make sure you're not making people strain to read what you have to say. So when you're designing text, it may look just fine when you're sitting right in front of your monitor. But when designing your slides, I'd like you to stand up from your desk and take 10 steps back. Chances are small text will be a distant, unreadable blob. Make it bigger, make it simpler, make it easy. If text is too small, it simply won't be read so it might as well just not be there. Overall, there's just so much you can do to make text dynamic. First, I'll show you various text design tools then give you examples of how you can use them. With text, you have size, obviously. Weight, how thin or bold the font is. 
kerning, which is the technical term for the space between each individual letter. Next, opacity. It's literally just about fading into the background, but of course, be mindful of contrast. Then you can change capitalization styles, like with small caps and alt caps. Don't use that too often, but it's great for headers and emphasis. Now I'll show you a single sentence presented multiple ways to convey different meaning and provide visual variation. I can make it happen. Again, using all caps is emphasizing the word happen. Want to emphasize something else? Well, let's use wait. I can make it happen. Same goes with opacity. By finding out, by fading out everything but the word we want to emphasize, it's popping out and it has the most visual impact. Or if you want a splash of style or want the whole sentence to stand apart from any other text on the slide, play with its kerning. These are all great examples of one of design's biggest goals, directing the eye. Purely through design, you want the audience to subconsciously know where to look at any given moment. That means thinking about it consciously as a designer. So decide what's most important at any given moment. Then make sure you give it the most pop. The next component is honestly the most important and underutilized tool in the design toolbox. Imagery, specifically your icons and photos. Their importance cannot be overstated. Why? The human brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text. 60,000, that's huge. When you take that fact and combine it with what we discussed earlier, that 90% of the brain's information is absorbed visually, that means icons and photos are truly your most valuable asset at conveying information and making sure that info is retained by your audience. Combining words with images goes a long way toward helping your audience remember that information you're trying to convey. When it comes to our memories, words are stored in short-term memory and quickly discarded. Well, images bypass that and go straight to long-term memory. There's even more power when the two are combined. When words and images are presented together, learning retention increases by a whopping 400%. This is why presentations are such a valuable tool and where icons and photos can become your most important allies. Try to find ways to highlight your most important keywords and make them stick by pairing with a matching icon or photo. With all that said, how should you choose your icons and images? To help with that, I'd like to play a little game similar to Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, except instead of a classic B-list movie actor, we're talking about the degrees of separation between your concept, and its visual representation. You want as few steps between them as possible in order for everything to be easily understood. If you're talking about something concrete, like an object, it's easy. Talking about ice cream sundaes, ta-da, there's a banana split. With only one degree of separation, concept and visual are perfectly blended and everything's understood. Where it gets a little harder is with more abstract concepts, like back when I was talking about authenticity, trust, etc. Try your best to find abstract images that still convey the general feeling with as few degrees of separation as possible. For authenticity that has roughly two degrees of separation, we were talking about being your authentic self. So I went for something that looked vaguely like me since I was talking. Concept to me to image, two degrees of separation. That's still okay, but any more than that, it'll be much harder for people to understand just how that image ties to what's being discussed. Trust is a little more straightforward. It's two people coming together in a handshake with the sense of mutual love. I'd say that's closer to one degree, maybe 1.5, but it still fits within the general feeling of the concept. So when you're choosing an image, think through how many steps is it between concept and visual representation. If there are too many steps, too many stops on that logic train, just stick to words because the wrong image can be detrimental, confusing, and distracting. When it comes to icons specifically, the biggest advice they can offer is avoid using multiple different styles of icons all in one presentation. Not only does it look kind of messy, but it's also just visually confusing to the audience. Typically, the simpler the icons, the better, but there are always exceptions to every rule. Bottom line, it's important that no matter what you choose, that they suit the style of your branding and that you keep them consistent. When it comes to photos, please don't be afraid of using stock imagery. They're not all as bad as the cliche woman laughing at her salad or hide the pain herald. If you know how you want to visualize your concepts, if you look very carefully, you can find lots of beautiful options for free. You can find anything from happy kids to adorable illustrations, photos from the past or futuristic textures, messages of inspiration or editorial beauties. You can even take it a step further and make it look like you took the photos yourself 
by carefully matching them to your own branding, changing their look and feel, or even drawing right on top of them to create something entirely unique to you. It's a great way to level up your use of stock imagery to make it especially unique. Lastly, just as it's important to have high quality photos, it's equally important that they're carefully placed. So much of design is both making it easier for the viewer, but also making it appear that everything was placed thoughtfully, deliberately, and carefully. Basically, you want to avoid it looking like you just copy and pasted random images into a white deck or stole a graph you found off Google Images. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's free for you to use. Please, please learn about photo and font licenses. It'll save you a huge legal headache later. There's also logo placed without bothering to find a transparency, let alone worrying about if it's centered or not. Or the biggest sin of all, grabbing a stock image you didn't even pay for. Notice nothing about this looks like any effort was placed into it at all. Nothing there to say, I thought about this. They're not aligned in any meaningful way. No rounded corners. Nothing to make it match your branding. They're just kind of dropped there. Wait, I take it back. There is something even worse than the stolen stock photo. The horribly pixelated tiny photo blown up so you see every bit of compression. Oh, that one hurts my heart. <laughs> Again, show your audience you respect them and that you respect paying for artists' time and talents and try to make it look careful and deliberate. Here are some examples of ways to make photos look deliberate. Add some kind of subtle framing, nothing too crazy, just a little tiny something. I would, however, recommend you avoid just plain line borders in most circumstances. Round the corners, or if it suits the image, round it off entirely into a nice circle. If you have a specifically shaped block of text and a specific shape for the picture, crop the picture to fit perfectly inside the space. If you don't know how to crop images, that's okay. That's what Canvas is for and it's free. All of these image tricks will help your content look more carefully designed and more thoughtfully placed. Notice, they're all carefully and evenly spaced as well, which brings us to the final piece of the components puzzle, margins. Margins are all about what's known as negative space. It may sound like a real downer, but trust me, it's a happy thing. This is where math intersects with design. Negative space is all about your design elements and the space up and down, side to side, and in between, going all around each of the elements in your design. If you notice with our examples, the distance from the top of our pink boxes to the next element above it is precisely the same as the distance from its bottom edge to the edge of the screen. That distance is also exactly the same as the space between the two boxes. Naturally, not everything can be the same all the time, but you can still mirror measurements wherever you can. Side to side measures exactly 475 pixels in both directions. If you're having a hard time measuring things, some software like Keynote and PowerPoint can show you exact placements based on pixel counts. Or you can cheat a little by creating handy measuring boxes. I'll add them to my screen, move them to where I need them, size them to measure the gap, and then move them around to make sure everything lines up. Then away they go, leaving behind a well laid out slide. Here, negative space is providing balance and precision, all to please the eye and make it that much easier to absorb information. Now watch how badly it looks when things go awry. <laughs> There's literally no rhyme or reason to why these elements are now asymmetrical. No two margins are the same, nothing matches, nothing flows. It looks like things were just dropped randomly without thought. In fact, in several places, it feels cramped. Believe it or not, tight, uneven margins have a significant emotional impact on your audience. They're known to increase anxiety and make people feel uncomfortable, rushed, or claustrophobic without even knowing why. I think I'm exaggerating. Filmmakers use this to their advantage all the time. Alfred Hitchcock pioneered classic horror filming techniques based on the psychology of margins and negative space. Next time you watch Psycho, notice how when the scene starts out, there are generous margins in symmetrical shots. Things start to get a little tighter, but they're still symmetrical and even. At the first sign of trouble, we're starting to get a little off balance, but we still have well-placed asymmetry with mirrored balance, each subject balancing out the other but then the thread appears. We're well into asymmetry now. The camera is tighter. The classic stream, now asymmetric on the opposite side of the screen. The camera's getting tighter. The cuts are getting faster. She's in the center, but the knife, the attack, the world off kilter, that's off to the side. All symbolism and symmetry and margins. Now the cuts are frantic. The camera's unbearably close. Nothing is centered. Everything's off kilter. Until finally the deed is done. The woman is dead. The world's no longer upright, no longer perfectly balanced as it was. Horror films use these techniques to this day. And it's all based on the psychology of margins. So please keep an eye on yours. 
Just like human beings who don't like to be cramped in small confined spaces, design elements don't like to feel cramped either. So make sure you always give them a little space. And just as I'm sure you don't want your audience to feel even remotely like this, try to find symmetry and balance wherever you can. Again, not everything has to be 100% exactly the same symmetrical. You just need to make sure if you introduce a design element or if you use a specific margin width, make sure it's mirrored somewhere else. That's all it is, consistent breathing room paired with symmetry and balance, all to make it as easy and comfortable as possible to learn. Now that we have our entire component skill set of software, color, font, imagery, and margins, it's time to get out the blender, combine everything we've learned thus far, sprinkle in a little seasoning with all the philosophies of Beyonce, ease of learning, and so forth, then whip it up to create our own slide deck layout. When creating for your layout, I'd like you to think in terms of anchors. Each element you create is a kind of visual anchor, a way to reassure the audience that when they, they're looking for information, they always know where to go, even if it's purely subconscious. Your first anchor is your header, being sure to bake in some kind of way to differentiate it from the rest of your slide area, either through typography alone, or maybe a unique change of color, or some kind of defining shape. Your header could go on the left or the right or in the center, but I prefer the left as we naturally start there given that we read left to right in this part of the world. Regardless, whatever you choose, use it, stick with it. If you want a subheading, it could go underneath the header, but if you find that it's eating into too much of your real estate, you can find another place for it, perhaps in the upper right. But of course, be mindful of how long your subheadings will be or if you even need them at all. Honestly, why add more words if you don't have to? If you have a simple enough logo, some entrepreneurs like to put it in the bottom right-hand corner. Some people will add a little itty bitty confidential warning in the bottom corner, but it's so small, no one's going to be able to read that in a presentation. Personally, I feel that kind of the same way about logos. This real estate is precious. So if it's not readable, if it's not serving any defined distinct purpose on each slide, why let it take up space? Besides, if your branding is consistent, they'll recognize who you are without needing to see your logo every single page. So save that for your email deck and get it out of here. Now that you have the vast majority of real estate to fill up with your content, I, I don't know if you noticed this, but this presentation has lots of standard layouts. Why are they always in sets of three? Because it's been shown that human beings are great at remembering three things at a time. Any more than that, and they'll quickly fade from our memories. So try your best to group things into sets of three, even if that means many items getting organized into only three categories. In addition to these big cards, you should always create lots of ways for presenting various types of information, each with their own rules about transitions that incorporate each item and how color and icons are used. Even if the size changes, the same pattern should be repeated to ensure familiarity, continuity, and automatic ease of understanding. This way, the audience knows what to expect. It's one less thing they have to work for or think about consciously. Come up with your own various layout rules, whatever works best for you and fits with your brand, then follow through with them. Every so often, shake things up with bold, attention-grabbing text, but do this sparingly or it will start to lose its impact. If you have something truly extra special to say, splash a big, bold image on the screen and make sure when you're saying something extra important that you feel it. Also, incidentally, when formatting your text, do you see what I did there? The R perfectly lines up with the I and the outer tail of the A lines up perfectly with the P. This is another way that margins can be used to create dynamic looking text. Or if these are acting as transition slides, ending one section and moving to the next, keep them consistent and keep their design open, bright, clean, and happy. Think of it as a breath of fresh air, giving the audience a chance to close one chapter in the notebook of their minds and open a fresh new clean chapter, ready to fill it in with even more information. Finally, at long last, a quick word about time. The length of your pitch is not determined by the number of slides. Rather, it's determined by your script, by the, what you say. If you spend 10 minutes explaining a really, really complex slide, you're going to spend exactly the same amount of time as if you spent one minute each on 10 simpler slides. Same amount of time spent, but 10 times as many slides. The only difference, your audience will thank you for using simpler, easier to understand content. So take your time and keep it simple. Speaking of time, Ours is coming to a close. We have finally come to the end of this long and wondrous rainbow of information, finding the treasure at the end, where you'll create and deliver the most impactful presentations of your entire life, building relationships that will help you unlock all the doors of opportunity in your company's future. So 
let's pop the champagne because you did it. Yay, we made it through the course. Woo! Now I'm really wishing PowerPoint had some kind of graduation cap so I could ceremoniously have you move that tassel from side to side. I'm a designer, let's make it happen. Move that tassel. Congratulations, perfect pitching graduates. You're now ready to make one hell of a perfect presentation. Now go get them because I believe in you. I don't just believe, I know that you are already that guru on top of the mountain. I'm so confident in your guru-ness that heck, I'm already right up there with you. Everyone on your team is up there and every one of your supporters. And of course, your family and friends, not to mention your customers or user base. This is one crowded ass mountain all built around belief in you. But as crowded as it is, I bet there's just enough room for your audience, for potential investors to join us up here supporting you. As you get up on that stage or start the pitch on Zoom, remember everyone is up here on your mountain helping to support you. And most importantly, the audience is rooting for you to do well. Now it's just time to make it happen with your own perfect pitch. You know what to do. Start with your stoplight check-in. Make sure you know your pitch goal, that you've considered who your audience is, so you know how to connect with their hearts and minds. With that in mind, think about getting that audience from idea to adoption. If you're struggling with how to put all the pieces together, remember your chapter framework. Use that to organize your storytelling structure, keeping the information flowing in a clear and logical manner. As you move into construction, always remember, believe in yourself, be yourself. Get up on that stage, tell your authentic story, get your deck ready, and be the star that you already know you are. Just in case you need some help, Perfectly Pitched is here, ready and willing to help you perfect your pitch. We're here for you. To help get you started, check out perfectlypitch.co slash DC, where you'll find all sorts of free classes and free resources, as well as an exclusive 10% discount for all DC Startup Week attendees. The site is chock full of great free stuff for founders. And for all you investors out there, there's info about our own upcoming seed round to build an AI-driven platform automating our branding and pitching methodologies. Even I had an ask. Perfectlypitch.co slash DC is a great place to get you started on your own perfect pitch. And it's not even listed on our main site's menu. So make sure you bookmark it before it disappears. Thank you so much for your time. And I really hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, hit me up. Thanks so much, Heather. That was brilliant. Oh, that was so, so good. Does anyone have any questions before we finish up today? Um, I know some people ask about recordings that should be sent by the team in the next in the coming days. We also have two more um, webinars coming up today, just so you're aware. The first one is top five CX strategies every startup should consider at now actually with Colin Crowley and then partnerships a new way to grow your startup, startup at 2 p.m with Ben Wright so um thank you so much to Heather for a wonderful presentation and um hopefully we'll see you on the other webinars as well all right thank you very much guys anybody have any questions feel free to jump off mute and chime in Uh, what was the best pitch deck you ever made? Oh, gosh. Um, I made a bunch in the past year. My absolute favorite was one where a friend of mine who is a woman, so obviously her odds of raising money are already low since women raise less than 3% of venture capital every year. She's LGBTQ, which further diminishes your odds. Um, she had a great storyline, but just needed some design help. I spent a weekend redoing her deck and we condensed her pitch down to three minutes. And she had an investment meeting about a month after that, where the investor said, you have 20 minutes. And she said, 20 minutes, I'll get it done in three. And they said, if you can really do that, we will send, we will give you a check. She did it. She got it. She secured a $1.5 million round like that. So yes. <laughs> Brevity is the soul of wit and financing. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. I have one more question. What's the best <laughs> way to communicate with you? But th great question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> best way to communicate with me, if you go to perfectlypitch.co slash DC, there will be a great big contact button and you can find our email address, uh, which is heather at perfectlypitch.co and you can reach out and I'm always happy to help entrepreneurs. We're very good at working with underrepresented founders, which means we get very creative about finding ways to get paid and get you what you need to get you funded. Thank you. Anyone else? before we finish up today.
Don't be shy. I don't bite. (laughs) (laughs) And they connect connect to you directly. Any other other one just in case you missed it one more time. Oh yeah, just the link. Brilliant, Sarah. Thank you. Heather, Mm -hmm. thank you so much. That was just oh brilliant. Really, really good. Um follow Heather um on Instagram and and pitch. DC as well and yeah thank you so much for your time Heather and everyone have a lovely day and thank you for joining DC Star Week on thank you so much bye <laughs> have a great week everybody bye